This is a Boston Acoustics TVEE26 uh, soundbar thingy with a wireless uh, subwoofer. Uh, I picked this thing out of the trash a couple of days ago and uh, I'm fairly keen on getting this thing working properly. Uh, when I first paired it up it was kind of working. Uh, this little power supply guy was making a horrid screeching noise and the thing wouldn't start uh, properly, but uh, when I replaced the power supply it uh, would actually power on and uh, it actually sounded fairly good. However, even with the other power supply it uh, has a bit of an issue where it keeps uh, uh, resetting and uh, imagining input that doesn't exist on these uh, capacitive touch buttons. So. I'm fairly confident that uh, this thing is going to have some bad caps on the inside and uh, that's an opinion justified by the fact that you can see some of the hardware inside and these caps do not look very expensive and since this thing runs on a 18 volts power supply it's obviously going to have some form of switching step down regulator for the logic inside the actual box so, I'm pretty keen on taking this thing apart and uh, trying to get it working properly. I really like the form factor of these sound bars, and this thing isn't particularly large, it's about 80 90 centimeters wide. So, I'm it, it's just a rather practical thing. You can put this thing on any little ledge or something and play music on it, and indeed, that's what I've been doing here at work, just having it sitting in the stairwell playing music <laughs> resting on top of a radiator. It just works great except for the bloody thing keeps changing sources and changing volume and restarting and being a general mess. So let's crack these things open starting with this one and see what we've got. Putting bad caps in that too. I'm a bit surprised we actually don't have anything obviously broken or bloated in this thing but uh, it's obviously a very cheap -o low quality paint supply, well we do actually have a mains filter in it but you can see the that text isn't something you'd find on a Nippon Chemicon and these secondary caps are just generic no name so called low ESR caps so I'm not betting that these were any good to begin with but since they're not obviously broken I think I'm going to just uh, Put that aside and tackle the thing by itself because if the regulating circuit in, the, in this can handle about uh, 20 volts or so, I could just run this thing off of a laptop power supply and get a, a bit of a more powerful power supply to boot, which probably wouldn't hurt since this thing does look a bit puny because this thing does go fairly loud actually. And for to do this, well, these tiny little speakers, it's I'm going to require a fair amount of power, so let's crack this thing open and have a look. About a hundred self-tapping screw latest, uh, we are into the wrong compartment. I uh, thought you had to remove the speaker front panel thing in order to get up the electronics, but you actually just have to remove this rear cover. But we do, do get a chance to look at the inside of this thing, and it's actually surprisingly well built. I was expecting way worse for one of these cheapo plastic sandbar things. Uh, what pops up to me the most is that you have these huge parts of this thing. Like, these are fairly long, tuned fairly low, which is surprises me since this thing is supposed to go with subwoofer. And these speakers, too, are look to be fairly heavy duty for what they are just one way simple basic TV speakers but they could have gone with way smaller magnets on those that's for certain and all these cables are nicely packed in foam so they don't, don't rattle around and there's even a bit of damping material there I'm very pleasantly surprised and there has the capacitive touch front panel not too much exciting going on there and this is probably the IR receiver and why we're actually electronic so let's flip this thing around and have a squeeze of that uh, here's the board and all its sound proof goodness 
this thing seems to be built around some on something I've never heard of before, D2 Audio. I know that's a Dol Dolby decoding thingy. I remember there seems to be some tiny little class D amplifier there. A L1227 HABG. Probably some pretty standard 10 ish watts per channel thing. Seems to be fairly efficient though. I mean, getting away with that tiny package, it's obviously just heat sunk to the board there. Oh no, this board seems to be of fairly high quality. Although we do have, again, not entirely obviously broken, but these are very generic capacitors. We don't even have a brand on them. Juco. Juco. Why is that Juco? No, it's Juco. So. There might just be a new player on the high-end cap market, but I'm going to take my chances and bet that these are just run-of-the-mill Chinese caps, whatever was cheapest on the Shenzhen market the particular week of this unit's manufacture. So I'm going to replace all these caps and see if it makes a difference. I also noticed that uh, this uh, ribbon cable running to the front panel seems to be a bit kinked right here before, it's before it enters the foam padding stuff, so that might be worth some investigation. There's also no decoupling to talk of a couple of ceramics here on the front panel. That could be a potential cause of issue, but I don't think this panel is going to be the root cause of a problem. I think it's going to be something on this board. But uh, I'm really surprised that I can't seem to find any switching regulators on this. Seems to be just a linear job. I've got a couple of chips there in here, which I'm going to have to do some research in. If it can run properly on 19 volts. Oh no, hang on, there we go. That uh, looks like a coil right there, so that's probably part of a switching regulator. So, yeah, that makes bad caps a very likely culprit. Alright, I did some searching around and it seems this thing actually has some fairly fancy switching voltage regulators in it. In particular a Texas Instruments LM40 something, which should handle up to almost 30 volts of input. So, I'm fairly confident to just hook this thing up to a laptop power supply and see if it makes any difference. I also put some isopropyl alcohol on the ribbon connector for the front panel since that one seemed to be a bit oxidized when I took it out, so who knows, it might not even have terribly bad caps I'm probably going to replace them anyway, but I'm going to let this thing just sit around and play for the rest of the day and see if the issue's gone away with a more powerful power supply the one I've used for testing has been a 16.5 volt supply of 16 volts even rather than the 18 that it came with, so it might be a a bit of an issue might not, I would not imagine it making any issue since it's probably bucking the voltage to uh, 12 volts or so. On the back of a laptop power supply with a standard plug on it, we've got a little lab power supply. It'll do just fine. A little 2 amp finish made job this. There's the subwoofer that belongs to the, the sound bar. It's a bit weird, it's entirely plastic, very resonant, but in my sincere opinion it actually sounds quite good. It seems to have a very low, low pass filter on it, it doesn't seem to kick on anywhere close to 100 hertz. so these resonances really don't seem to matter since they are, I mean, that's far well above 80 hertz. And the green LED means that it's wirelessly coupled to the unit because, as you can see, it's only got a power card. And that's a very, very nice feature in my mind. Not the most high fidelity option, but hey, who cares? It's a cheap subwoofer. Anyway, let's see if this thing will power on, feeding it 19 volts. And it certainly seems to be doing something. 
This is where it starts to get a bit weird. I've got no sound going into it right now. Yeah, and I think it turned off there. Yeah. So now it's on, I can adjust the volume, change the source, but if we wait, I think it actually turns off. No. It's still on. But if we turn it off and actually put on some signal, it's going to get a bit weird because nothing in the manual says anything about it waking up automatically but it obviously does and if you've got a signal going into it you can't really turn it off because it will just turn itself back on in a moment I'm honestly not really sure how you are supposed to turn this thing off at all uh, with a signal, signal going into it because I think it will wake up uh, even if you change the source, even if you do anything uh, that doesn't seem to wake up from the optical input yeah, it's a bit weird a bit slow and clunky to use too but I've got some sort of remote route, so it's okay. And as for the sound quality, it's not too bad. We're on a echoey stairwell now, so it's not going to be perfect. And my mic but these camera microphones won't pick anything below 60 Hz up, so make with what you will, but in my mind it sounds more than okay for what it is and you're not going to be able to hear it but that will adjust does for very low frequencies and it's actually audible like if I'm sitting here I can hear it pushing a to you know, 20 something hertz it's fairly rolled off by then but it, there's something coming out of it which is quite impressive for something this size I think it has a 6 inch driver in a ported box this thing play for the day and we'll see if it screws up anything more. It was very obvious the last time it got issues because it just would not ever turn on again. It would just sit there, it will flash its LEDs briefly and not really do anything so we'll see. So I just brought it home and started replacing caps on it uh, just mindlessly going by the labels on the caps rather than just measuring around and I started getting a bit annoyed at all the high voltage caps they've used because uh, all the large electrolytics are 25 volt rated except for one or two and uh, I just noticed that that's uh, entirely retarded because I just hooked it up and uh, it goes like this these two caps are filtering a 3.3 volt rail 25 volt rated caps, and I put well, no, I think we were 10 volt rated these two. Uh, I think that one might have been 25 volt rated, that one was 10 volt rated. It doesn't <laughs> measure if they were in parallel or not, but fairly obviously are. One of these two 25 volt 470s is filtering a 5 volt rail, I think it's this one, and um, this one's doing another 3.3, no, this one's doing a 1.8. <laughs> and uh, these two are doing, I believe, 5 volts, even though they're 25 volt rated. The only caps that will see the entire 18 volt uh, power supply is this uh, primary filter capacitor and uh, these three in the power amplifier circuit. While the other ones are just 5 volts and under. I can't believe I've <laughs> shoved 35 volt caps in there. I feel entirely stupid now. At least I know better for the last two that I left to replace there. Also, I did find that uh, there's a very small uh, 100 microfarad 10 volt rated cap in hip in between here. It was tucked under a heap of goo, and it measured obviously bad. And uh, upon replacing that and actually pairing the board up. 
it seemed to behave a bit differently. Above all, it started up a bit quicker and actually stayed on without a signal input. So I think that might have been something to do with it behaving a bit improperly, but I haven't tested it conclusively yet. We're going to have to see once I get all the caps done. And there we go, all the caps that I intend to replace have been replaced. I also added these uh, minuscule little copper pieces as heat sinks to the underside of the amplifier chip. Seems to seem to be running a bit tasty. Uh, not sure if these are going to do much, but they're not going to do any harm. So now I've just got to get it back into the box and uh, See if it works. Uh, but the joys don't last long though. It just did it again. It switched source on its own. If we can get it back on. Yeah, it wasn't red. Now it's orange. And uh, now it doesn't seem to want to do much at all. Bummer. Don't have to go further. Okay, so I just tried to fire this thing up, and uh, it was so bad that it would barely even register any input on the front panel. I tried to switch source, and it just wouldn't respond. It wouldn't do volume control. It wouldn't even react to a power button. So, since I know that the caps uh, on the board are okay. I took the thing apart again and started looking at the actual front panel of the capacitive touch controller. And uh, I started by just uh, putting some contact spray on this uh, ribbon cable, which uh, didn't do anything. Well, although I did get it to actually turn on and react to input, so it, but it responded very poorly. So what I did then was to just uh, reflow all of these components i also added this extra uh, shielding strip that's connected to ground on the board there because I'm not sure if there's any real shielding on behind these uh, buttons. It seemed to react a bit when I was poking around there. So I'm figuring it might be p picking up a bit more interference that it might be designed to in case of a cheap date and made it a bit of a um, right on the edge build with this touch controller. And I've got it to the point where it seems to actually be responding fairly well, although I can't say for certain if it's just uh, random or if it's actually working properly. It is a bit... you need to hold the buttons down very long for it to react, but it seems to be supposed to be that way. Also, curiously, the input button is the one that seems to have the most issues. The mute button works great, this... Uh, improve audio improvement thingy button seems to be responding fairly well. Volume control was a bit dicky. It works a lot better now. But yeah, the input button is the worst one, and you can see it doesn't respond anywhere near as well as the others. I believe even need to be close to that one for it to work. The input is really. Hmm. It might be that the further right you go, the further away from the touch controller you get, the the worse the response of the buttons, which would explain why the volume controller is usually pretty bad. But I don't really care if the buttons are responding poorly because I've got the remote, which is all I'm going to ever use anyway. I'm just interested in getting it to not switch inputs on its own and turn itself off. It seems to be behaving a lot better now. I mean, when I started today, it wouldn't do anything at all. The input button did not do a single thing. It was just stuck on the green input. So I've got to put it back together and uh, let it play for a while and see if it acts up again. Fingers crossed. What I've done now, since the modification of the, the front panel didn't work, is I've turned the unit on and disconnected the front panel after it's turned on I set to the correct source and volume and indeed it went playing for about 15 hours now and with no issues so 
this pretty much rules out anything but an issue on this board since uh, if there was an issue about with the communication between the boards you would think that that was uh, on the main board you would think that uh, the main board would still be acting up whether or not this board is connected but it obviously isn't it could still be something like that but uh, I'm reasonably certain that there's something wonky with this board and there isn't a whole lot of stuff going on there behind this screen we've just got some LEDs and capacitive touch buttons so it's basically just PCB although we do have these uh, capacitive coupling devices there uh, with I'm assuming, <laughs> I'm no expert in capacitive touch buttons, but uh, they should have something to do with the buttons since they are just kind of the traces going in under there, so what I'm thinking is that I'll actually remove uh, a couple of them and see, or I'll just poke around first in order to determine which components are connected to what, and try and disconnect the source button, since that seems to be the only one that's actually acting up. Hmm, I think we might be onto something regarding actually finding a problem with this device because I've got my scope hooked up to just ground on the touch sensitive touch sensor board now and technically if I probe one of the buttons that don't trigger abnormally for instance as with power button you can see we have a fairly wide pulse there and the same goes for there should be a volume button fairly wide pulse weird cinema sound button but watch what happens when we go to the source select button it's very different and it's got a very very short pulse compared to the other ones and it's just that's that's not looking too good that looks like I don't know like it might be trying to Right, but it's obviously not making it. So I think this chip might be having some bit of an issue because the good ones they kind of flicker a bit and then give up. That's just a very big difference. Yeah, I think I'll just try and disconnect the source button and make it so we can only switch sources from the remote because that I don't know, it doesn't seem. Right, one button would be different from the others, and that it coincidentally would be the button that doesn't work properly. Alright, I've disabled the button by installing a 12k pull down resistor to ground uh, on top of it. It's a bit crude, it isn't really how you disable a button according to the datasheet, but uh, in order to do that, you would have to you know, do a fair amount of modifications since they're multiplexed. I must have the datasheet for, for this chip, the uh, Azotec IQS222 is very available, so that makes everything a bit easier. But I'm going to try and run this unit like, like this, I've checked there's basically nothing coming through to the button anymore, and uh, all the other buttons work except for the input select one. So there should be a fair chance of this unit actually working. I just hope that I can still switch sources by the remote. And it's been playing alright for 5 or 6 hours now. And all the front panel works. Except for the input button. So I think I'm just going to say that I'm fairly confident, or rather I'm 100% confident that the issue is within the touch capacitive touch controller chip on the front panel board and replacing that chip would with a basically a hundred percent certainty fix the issue because the entire touch button circuit is just the chip followed by a single resistor and then uh, the piece of PCB that goes underneath a button which makes up an antenna so there's really nothing else that could be wrong there, so for the resistor, but it works since shorting the button side of the of it to ground disables the button, so there's really nothing else that could be wrong there. So I could replace the chip, but I'm not going to because I've got the cute little cheap remote that belongs to this unit, so I can still switch sources 
however much I want by just using the remote and that's basically all I'm going to do with this thing since I've got another portable speaker the only difference between this is that it doesn't have a remote control so obviously I'm just going to use this when I need a remote control and maybe sometime down the road I'll change the chip out if I feel need to but eh, it's just a bit, bit of a bother right now and just for curiosity's sake let's have a look at how this unit behaves when you lower the supply voltage I tried running it at up to 20, a 20 volt uh, wall watt which worked fine although I'm not sure I would recommend it since the I can't find any specification for the actual amplifier chip so you might blow that at high volume if you run it at much above 18 volts but I would say that a 19 volt laptop wall watt would be just fine anyway let's layer it and just see if we can actually run it on a lead acid battery well, certainly since we can the volume seems to go down when you lower the supply voltage but you can probably just turn that back up yeah you're probably going to lose a fair amount of output power running it off a battery but this really seems there we go it cuts out at 8 volts curiously the logic doesn't seem to be restarting it's just the amplifier chip cutting out but yeah this thing seems to definitely be doable to run on the lead acid battery 12 volts if you want to Whoa, let's not explode there. Doesn't seem to use too much power at all. Let's just crank it up as loud as it goes. Yeah. Sticks at 200 milliamps no matter what you do. So all of this thing can be run on a lead acid battery if you want to. Very useful indeed. I'm probably going to be doing that at some stage. Well, you can run it off a computer power supply, just power it off your normal desktop computer. That might indeed be something I'm going to use this for. Just powering it off uh, the internal power supply of my computer. Since it has an optical input, you can get around the issue of having a ground loop between the power outlet and the signal inlet. Uh, that's something when I tried to power this little leap eye of my computer power supply and it just hummed and screamed at me because of a ground loop, but this thing could certainly get around that. Hmm. Anyway, hope you found that uh, interesting and helpful. Diagnosing a failed touch cr touch control IC on a Boston TVEE26 soundbar. Thanks for watching. Cheerio. Right, just for the fun of it, I decided to add some uh, sound uh, dampening to the plastic cabinet of the soundbar. So here's a recording of uh, Pink Noise played through it uh, without the damping installed. And then switching over to a recording of it after I installed the sound deadening material. And as you may or may not have been able to hear, there was a fair amount of resonance uh, somewhere around uh, about 250-250 hertz on the first clip, which was basically entirely deleted on the second one. Uh, this thing actually sounds completely okay now. Thank you for watching. Cheerio.